Well, Margaret, bless you once again for setting me up. It's a downhill all the way from here, I'm afraid. Um, arguably, the biggest disadvantage of having an election now is that you were going to get real politicians coming here to speak to you, and instead you have to do with me as a poor substitute because, uh, of course, they're all away uh, campaigning. But first of all, and I know I do this on behalf of you all, I really want to say a big thank you to Matteo. I think there was so much sense, so much, so much vigour and vitality coming from, after all, it is your generation. We are making decisions today, not for our generation, for but you. for your generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. important. And, and, and I really, you know, thank you very much. It, it would be nice to think that some of your activities that you were describing are responsible for what we're now seeing, which is a massive increase in the registration of young people to vote in this general election. Uh, I suspect that three years ago, there were a lot of young people who didn't participate in the referendum, who felt bitterly disappointed afterwards that they had not participated, and I don't think they're going to make that mistake again. And I hope and pray that a lot of young people feel that not participating when they have the chance in the political process is not going to get their voice listened to. Why is it that people like me have got a triple lock pension, some of the people in this room now, because we turn out to vote and governments respond to that? Why is it that we've still got student loans as an enormous burden on the back of the yeah, 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 Because yeah, students yeah. don't turn out That's to right. vote, and so that all the politicians have gone away yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the, we need to have that young voice coming in and saying to the politician, you need to listen to us, exactly. not just to the older generation. But look, I, I wanted to just share a few reflections on political division, and of course that impacts on social division as well. But before I do, um, I want to just reflect a little bit um, on what happened this morning. Uh, you reminded us that religion can often be ascribed as a source of conflict, can often be regarded as a source of conflict. Yes, that's true, but let's just analyse why that is. Actually, there is nothing wrong with any religion's basic tenets or principles. They are universal. They are, as so many people have said already, brings us to show that there is more that unites us rather than divides us. The trouble with religion is the way it's interpreted mm -hmm. by us, by human beings, and has been over the centuries. The great schisms, the great bloodletting, the Inquisition, all those terrible blots on the face of religion have been as a result of the interpretation, very often for political reasons, transporting the whole message of religion and violating it in terms of the way it is actually applied. So I think it's important to remember that we are the ones who spoil religion, not religion itself. Principles are really important. The other thing I wanted to just draw on was what Marcus reminded us. That once you say something, you can never bring it back. <clears throat> once you do something, you can never undo it. Everything we do and say has consequences. And I fear so often now in public life, there are far too many people who are too ready to mouth their own prejudice or their bigotry without actually thinking about the consequences. It is arguable that Henry II, when he was having trouble with Thomas a Becket in that great fight between the uh, secular and the religion as a, which should hold greater sway when he said, allegedly, who will rid me of this troublesome priest, didn't actually mean to actually have the four knights take it literally and to go down to Canterbury and murder him on the steps of the cathedral. But, interestingly, Henry II <coughs> lived with the consequences by, I'm sure it wasn't very hard, but uh, having himself publicly flogged and wearing sackcloth and ashes as, as a result. But it shows just how the loose word can actually lead to all sorts of terrible consequences, many of them wholly unintended. And so that's why I wanted just to talk about principles for a moment, and um, principles in political life. Now, it's what, 25 years since the Committee on Public Standards 
published its report, so-called the Nolan Principles, because it was chaired by Lord Nolan. And I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I've got them here. And I just wanted to remind you of, um, of what they are, because they're all so, so relevant today. And you will make your own assessment as to whether they are actually being employed by some of our politicians or not. First of all, selflessness. Wow. Holders of public office should take decisions solely in terms of the public interest. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes, good idea. Is it, is, it, is it actually done? It's all right. Come here. Can, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Just very um, so that's the first thing. Public interest, not personal interest, not sectoral interest, not even sectional interest, but overall interest. And, of course, it throws us back to good old Edmund Burke, who 250 years ago gave a speech to his electors in Bristol and saying, and I paraphrase because I can't quote it verbatim, saying that I am elected as your representative, not your delegate. I am sent to Parliament by you to exercise my judgment on your behalf. And if I fail to ex exercise it in the way you think is proper, you have the right to get rid of me at the next general election. I am not your delegate. Now, in these days of modern media, where change.org can suddenly assemble 100,000 signatures for anything you like, saving the polar bear or whatever it might be, where people are used to instant gratification, whereby just using one of these things, you can summon 100,000 people in Parliament Square in nanoseconds to protest against something. How much thought goes into that? Are people really able in a plebiscite, because that's what it is, a form of plebiscite, are they really able to make a disinterested, proper judgment? And I would question that they are. I'm not saying people are stupid. I'm not saying people are uninformed. But what I'm saying is you act in haste, you repent at leisure. And if you suddenly, on the spur of the moment, get so angry about something that you think you can have an instant gratification by signing a petition or something like that, you may suddenly realize that you were not privy to all the nuances, all the influences, all the, the deep complexities that were involved in that, and so therefore can make a grave, grave error. That's why we have representative democracy. Sadly, in my view, anyway, some of you may share it, I believe many of our politicians these days see themselves more as a delegate, more open to the force of public opinion in their constituencies, rather than actually exercising that fundamental judgment that Edmund Burke enjoins us all to do when we are elected to, to Parliament. And as a result of that, unfortunately, how do you anyway gauge the true public opinion in your constituency, even if it was valid to just say 51% say this, 49% say that, so therefore I'm going to go with a 51%, which incidentally is not democracy. That's Bolshevism. Lenin was no Democrat. That's Bolshevism. That's devil take the hindmost. The majority, even by one, is always right, and therefore the minority do not matter. Democracy is accommodating minority voices. Democracy is actually listening to those you disagree with, to actually trying to accommodate them in some way in the overall interests of the general, of the general wealth and public. And that is the most important thing. So. Uh, that is why I believe we have, and we should still cling to, the concept of representative uh, democracy. And in, in a way, Churchill summed it up in that famous phrase where he said, as a member of parliament, your first duty is to your country, because you're elected to the national parliament. Your second duty is to your constituency. And your third duty, and only your last duty, is to your party and of course he crossed the floor twice anyway but it's an important concept to remember so let me just put that into some perhaps uh, topical concept if you believe that nuclear power is in the best interests of your country but 
they're proposing to build one in your constituency and your electors are against it, then you should have the courage to say, I'm sorry, but actually in the national interest, we need nuclear power. If, however, there's no national interest involved, then you're perfectly entitled to go along with your constituents and say, I'm sorry, we don't want that there. If your party is saying, we must have nuclear power, but you believe it to be fundamentally wrong, then you should vote against your party, not just be a, a mere mouthpiece for, for the whips. What's the second one? Integrity. Well, it's what Matteo was talking about. Trust. And the lack of trust is so often, as we know, born of ignorance. And that sad, almost inevitable cycle of ignorance leading to mistrust, mistrust leading to hatred, and ultimately killing people on the battlefield because you disagree with them or you don't like them or you believe they are not part of what your vision is for the future. That's the ultimate obscenity of what leads us from that state of ignorance into that mis mistrust. Objectivity, yes, not just looking at something from your own subjective point of view, but looking at it from the point of view of taking a, account of all the eclectic evidence that is out there, ready to actually bring that to bear and to have the courage to say, I may have had that view in the past, but now I am wrong because the evidence has changed and therefore I must change as well because the whole circumstances have changed. Accountability, I need to say very little about that. But frankly, I think far too many people now think they are above the law, they are above accountability, or they're uncertain as to whom they are accountable anyway. We need to re-establish that principle very much. Openness, saying what you mean and meaning what you say is so important to have that trust that Matteo was talking about in, in, in public life. Honesty speaks for itself, and sadly, we don't see too much of that these days. We see the fake news that Matteo was referring to. We see the perversion of the facts. Statistics, yes, you can get statistics to say anything you like. But if you knowingly manipulate them, if you are selected, selective in your choice of which ones you rely on, neglecting the ones that you don't like, you're not being honest. You are actually being grossly deceitful and using that to try to further your own subjective aims. And finally, leadership. Um, when I was learning Welsh, I went to Colleg Harlech, which is on the west coast of Wales, underneath that wonderful imposing castle of uh, Harlech, one of the ways that Edward I decided to try to dominate the Welsh and remind them that they were a subject people, so it has an unfortunate origin, but nevertheless, it's a wonderful edifice and a great tourist attraction. And over the door of the entrance to Colleg Harlech, where they teach Welsh, is the old Welsh phrase, Bid Ben, Bid Bont, which in translation means he who should be a leader needs to be a bridge. And it speaks for itself. If you cannot bridge, if you cannot move across to the other side and understand where people are coming from, you cannot aspire to leadership because you do not have the qualities necessary to be a good leader. Some of you have heard this before from me, I'm afraid, but I'll say it again because I believe it's an essential truth. As a barrister, I was always trained to put myself in the position of my opponent. Why? Not out of philanthropy, I'm afraid, although that would have been a good enough reason in itself, but simply out of self-interest. Because without knowing the strengths or weaknesses of my opponent's case, I could not exploit those or home in on particular ones that I wanted to in order to project my own case. But it's an essential truth, isn't it? How often when we're talking to somebody and they express a view, and sometimes perhaps not very articulately, and a lot of people don't actually say things in the way they mean. They can, English language is horrendously ambiguous, as we know, just by looking at, at, at the dictionary uh, and seeing all these words meaning different things. But 
so often people don't express themselves. But if they say something, do you immediately bridle? Do you immediately say, I don't believe that, this person must be mad? And do you then respond in like tone? And then at the end of the day, you're in a massive great argument, probably on a basic misunderstanding in the first place, where you just misinterpreted something that somebody had said, or they'd said it in a way that they didn't really mean. And to take stock back, to just step back and say, just explain a little bit more what you mean by that. That is a form of reaching out, which is so, so important in modern life, but also particularly in, in modern politics. So I think that um, what we need to do now is we really need to remind those of, of our political leaders who aspire to great office or whatever, is to remind them that actually those Nolan principles are as live and valid today as they were 25 years ago. The, the concept of understanding the other person is as alive as well today as it ever was throughout history. And, you know, when we, when we look to our faith, and I use that in a broad sense because it's true of all faiths, you may not like your neighbour, but you do have to love them. And what does that mean by loving your neighbour? Well, it means the things I've been talking about. It means not always assuming the worst of somebody. It means actually giving them the benefit of the doubt. It means trying to find out exactly where they're coming from. Trying to put yourself in the position of that person. Why is it that they've got this fundamental view that is so different from your own? Is it something about their background? Is it something about their upbringing? Is it something about their colour, their race, their religion? Is, it, is that the reason why they are saying something which you feel so contrary towards? And only if you begin to understand that, only if you begin to understand where people are coming from, can you truly have a proper dialogue. And at the end of the day, politics is and should be about dialogue. Now, politics is a rough trade. If any of you have been to the House of Commons, you will see, but unfortunately, for me anyway, unlike European legislatures or other ones around the world, we sit facing each other, screaming at each other and waving order papers and trading insults, rather than sitting in that semicircular way where the speaker goes to the rostrum, everybody has to sit around and listen and they can't really throw any insults at them or, or whatever, it's more difficult to do so. Right. Why? Because when the House of Commons was looking for a place to go, when it, uh, has its, old, its old place was getting a bit ramshackle, uh, Henry VIII was asked, did he have any suggestions? And he said, yeah, I've got that old swamp-infested, rat-infested, nasty, marshy palace called Westminster. I never go there. I go to Hampton Court because it's so much nicer. But, you know, I never use... And it's true. This is all true. I never use Westminster. And there's an old chapel there called St Stephen's Chapel. They can have that. And how do you think we ended up with the configuration we've got now? It's because in some chapels that you still see, unlike what is mostly the system where people sit in theatre style facing the altar, these had the pews facing each other. And so that they sat in the old chapel, and when that no longer became usable, and I won't bore you with the rest of the history of the Palace of Westminster and the Houses of Parliament, but when it was reconfigured, it was reconfigured in exactly the same way. And that is why we have those two sides, which incite polemics. They incite people shouting at each other because you're eyeballing them yeah. on the other side. <laughs> and those of you, again, who've been to the chamber of the House of Commons will have noticed two red lines right. down the front. Now, you know what I'm going to say, those of you who've been. And uh, it always used to amuse me greatly, because I was in the know, that when somebody from the front bench stood up to speak, and inadvertently, when they were speaking, in their enthusiasm, they put their foot across a red line. There were suddenly shouts from all over the house, order, order, order. And the poor chap didn't know what he'd done wrong <laughs> until somebody pointed out, you're, you're treading over the sword line. And those two lines are the sword lines. 
and they are precisely the distance between two men's form it was men two men's forearms and the length of a sword so they couldn't actually touch in the middle because in those days when we didn't have the dear old peelers or the bobbies or the police on the streets you always carried a sword because you didn't want to be done to death by a, by a foot pad or somebody on the way home so you had to defend yourself so you went into the in into the chamber with the sword Incidentally, now they've changed all that. I think they've even done away with this now because I'm a bit out of date having been there a long time ago. But in the cloakroom where you used to hang your coats, there was on every coat hanger a little red ribbon, a complete ribbon. What was that for? That was to hang your sword on. <laughs> and it was still there when I left Parliament in 1987. But I think that's, that's gone now. So, Anyway, I, I'm going to end there because um, I hope what I've done is to alert you to some of the problems that we've got, but some of the principles which are still valid and we need to be reminded about. Now, what is interesting is, of course, in the 1960s, more than 50% of the electorate firmly identified with a political party. It was usually one of the two major political parties, Labour or Conservative. That last year shrunk to 9%. Only 9% of the total electorate firmly allied themselves with one particular political party. Yeah. However, when you asked the question, are you a Lever or a Remainer, 44% firmly identified with one side or the other. So it means, in effect, we've swapped political party political tribalism for another form of tribalism Matteo spoke about the difference between the older generation and the younger generation that is an increasing source of division within our society we still have and we always have and the bible reminds us constantly we will always have them indeed Jesus did the rich and the poor we will always have that division but one issue I would give you of hope is that despite those divisions, which I'm afraid a referendum encourages, because it only gives you, you can only be on one side or the other. You're either a yes or a no. And so therefore, it almost compartmentalizes people anyway, in a, I think a very destructive way. But one thing I would say to you is this. But just cast your mind back to British history, and you will realize that we may think now that Brexit has divided the nation, and it has, you may think that's irrevocable, I don't. You may think that we're still going to be talking about Brexit in 10 years' time, I believe we will. Uh, <laughs> but, but you may think that that's going to prevent society coming together, I don't. And when you look back at the divisions that we've had, remember since the Test Act of 1672, no Roman Catholic was allowed to take a seat in Parliament until that was changed in 1829. We discriminated against Roman Catholics in the most horrendous way. This whole history of the split in religion, and I won't even mention the Lollards and all, all the other schisms that have existed, but religion has been a far greater source of division in this country over a much, much longer period than I think even Brexit will manage to surpass. And so that is something to, to be encouraged. But as I say, there are those other divisions which are increasingly dangerous in terms of generation and such like. And unless our politicians grapple with those, then I think we really are in for probably uh, a rough time. But thank you all very much indeed.